Well, my name is Eric Clavens, and I'm uh, the chair of the ECE department. And um, uh, I'd like to welcome you to our, you know, very first ever virtual alumni town hall. Um, and uh, let's see, I've been here at the University of Washington for 17 years now, um, but I've only been the chair since April. Um, and uh, I took over on April 1st, uh, just at the same time that the lockdown was starting and quarantine was starting. And so it's been um, a heck of a ride so far, um, but uh, it's, it's really been a wonderful experience for me um, to, to begin to take the reins of this, this department. So um, my own research area, just so you have a little bit of background on me, is in control systems. Uh, my PhD was actually in computer science and engineering from the University of Michigan. Um, my current research area is synthetic biology, protein engineering, laboratory automation, um, and currently uh, one of our big projects is on um, COVID therapeutics. Um, so uh, I hope that you are all doing well with the, um, the lockdown and quarantine. And if you're on the West Coast, if you're actually apparently now also on the East Coast, um, dealing with uh, all of the smoke, um, here at ECE, um, we've had a lot of big changes because of, of all of these things happening. So um, uh, in particular, in, uh, last spring, we were completely, we moved all of our classes online. Um, and that was a huge lift. We had to figure out how to send, you know, lab kits all over the world, actually, um, and, and change all of our curriculum over. It was a, it was a really big um, change and and this coming quarter we are almost completely 100% online again, um, but you know I think that that it's um, you know it's it's actually a challenge but it's also a real opportunity for us to um, to figure out uh, a lot of these tools about teaching online are, are tools that our students are more and more used to and more and more expecting, and so this is is something that you know. And if you think about all the technology that's involved in bringing you this Zoom meeting, there's a lot of ECE technology all the way through it. And so if anyone's going to, you know, learn how to use this stuff to, to teach well and to do our, um, to, to do all the things we do as, an, as a department um, with all these online tools, I think it's, it's us. Um, one thing that uh, is kind of interesting that I think you've probably experienced is all these worldwide Zoom meetings like we're having now. Um, I had one with my extended family uh, on five continents. And one of the things we asked ourselves was, why didn't we do this before COVID? <laughs> why, you know, we could have had a Zoom meeting um, last year, um, but we didn't. And so there's something about this transition that's really making people realize that at least in some cases, not, not all of them, but in some cases, there's some benefits to being able to have access to these kinds of tools and, and do these kinds of things. So similarly, you know, this online event I'm not sure everybody on the guest list would have been able to come to Seattle in person, um, but we're pretty excited to be able to reach out to people who are all over the country and possibly all over the world with this. And we're going to continue these kinds of events um, going forward. So we have um, uh, a tradition of hosting these alumni gatherings in various ways. So a uh, next uh, thing that you might be interested in attending um, is our Lytle lecture, and that's on Thursday, November 19th. Um, Scott Aronson from UT Austin will be talking about quantum computing. And um, if you're interested in attending that, then please um, uh, check our webpage or look out for emails and we'll make sure to get you that information about how you can log in and listen to that lecture. Um, it should be pretty cool. Um, today, we're going to focus mostly on research, but I want to make sure that you kind of updated, um, as I was discussing before I knew that you were all logged in. Um, on uh, some of the stuff that's happening in the department. So, um, you know, our, our department is, is uh, 1,132 students enrolled currently. We have 66 faculty. Um, we have 350 degrees that we awarded in 2020. Um, the number of students that we are um, actually bringing through the program is, is increasing considerably. We've just agreed um, with the state of Washington to increase that number. Um, and and actually nationally, what this means is that UW ECE ranks in the top five for the number of degrees that we, uh, that, that we award every year in, among ECE departments in the, in the country. Um, and uh, our faculty and students continue to be recognized nationally with lots of um, uh, 
uh, awards and, and large grants and international research programs and startup companies and tech transfer and so on, um, I really encourage you to, uh, we'll be sending out, uh, well, we send out a variety of different, um, you know, um, uh, information about uh, some of the successes of um, various people in, in the department, from students to alumni to faculty. And, and so um, be on the lookout for those because it's all, um, it's pretty exciting stuff. Um, one of the things that uh, is, is a big deal that's happening right now is, as you know, we changed our department name from EE to ECE, and that was a year or two ago, I guess. Um, so many of you may have graduated from the department of EE, but we're now ECE. And we're really um, uh, taking this, uh, this name change quite seriously. So we are figuring out ways to, to put computing into every single aspect of our undergraduate and graduate education. Um, in our professional master's program. Um, we're working with industry to figure out a lot of industry people, and many of you are industry people, and, and maybe you can back this up, but a lot of people are, are basically telling us that, um, you know, if you don't have the computing, um, it's hard for you to work on a team these days, because even if you are, say, a circuits person or a controls person or a signal processing person, still the computing is at the heart of a lot of what that is. And so I think we have a really interesting opportunity as a department to to figure out how to do that right um, and incorporate computing into everything we do. So those are that's kind of where our department is at. Um, uh, we're doing uh, really quite well. We're focusing on um, making sure that our students and our community stay together um, in these challenging times, and and we're continually growing and 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 looking at new things. Um, so the purpose of today, though, is to not talk uh, most uh, about education too much, but mainly to talk about research. Um, and our goal is to have you interact with this panel that we've assembled. So we have um, some leading experts um, and uh, in quantum information technology, brain computer interfaces, and sustainable energy. Um, and these are areas where UW um, ECE is a world leader. And um, these uh, panelists are individual researchers, but they also have big labs and they're actually parts of, parts of even larger efforts on campus in the Northwest and nationally um, in their area. So it's really a, um, a fantastic uh, uh, opportunity to interact with people who, who are sort of really at the cutting edge of, of what's going on. Um, I'll be serving as the moderator and um, it's meant to be interactive. So I'm gonna seed them with their first question, but then after that, it would be great if you could ask questions. And one way to do that is to submit questions via the Zoom chat feature. We also have some questions that people um, uh, added uh, when they registered, I guess, for the workshop. And so um, you can start thinking of those and posting them. And then I'll try to make sure that I'm like asking questions at, um, and keeping the thing going. So to introduce people, uh, Professor Kaime Fu, uh, she's an associate professor in UW ECE Photonics and Nano Devices Research Group. She's uh, the director of the Optical Spintronics and Sensing Lab. and her Research focuses on identifying and controlling the quantum properties of point defects in crystals, um, which has applications in information and sensing, uh, quantum information and quantum sensing. Uh, she's won an NSF Career Award, the Cottrell Scholar Award, and the UW College of Engineering Junior Faculty Award. She just won a $3 million NSF grant to train students in quantum engineering. And a cool thing to know about Kaime is that she wants to build a cloud accessible five bit quantum computer in the basement of my building and is currently um, trying to figure out how to get that started. So if you're interested in that, ask Kaime about how you can log in and send your own wave functions to the computer she's going to build. I'm putting you on the spot. You're going to make that thing, Kaime. Um, Amy Orsborn is an assistant professor in UW ECE Biosystems Research Group. She joined the UW in 2018 as the Claire Booth Luce assistant professor in electrical computer engineering, and she has a joint appointment in bioengineering. And her lab explores the interfaces between um, neural or neural interfaces as adaptive closed loop systems that engage neuroplasticity in the brain and spinal cord. Um, she has many honors, including a L'Oreal USA for Women in Science Fellowship and a 2020 Google Faculty Research Award. And um, I think the thing to know is that Amy is building neural interfaces that read and write to actual brains, and her lab is in the Primate Center here at UW. So like real brains, um, not joking. Uh, sorry, as a um, person who doesn't work on brains, I think that's pretty cool. 
Um, Bao Shen Zhang is a professor, um, is assistant professor in UDF ECE's computing and, net, in, uh, computing and network power and energy systems group, also works in robotics and controls. His research is focused on designing a more efficient power grid, which is applicable to sustainable energy systems. He's the Keith and Nancy Raddy Endowed Career Development Professor. And a thing to know about Bowson is that he recently, he's already, he's only been here for, uh, since 2015, he's already graduated six PhD students. And two of them are actually assistant professors. So I don't know, and that's pretty, um, pretty impressive right there. Um, I would have loved to have that. So my first question, and I think we should go in the order of Kaime, Amy, and then Bowson, is quickly, so that we have time to have lots of questions, what's the most disruptive thing that's happening in your field um, right now over the last year or so? So Kaime. All right, so I, I think the most disruptive thing that's happening in my field is that uh, researchers, and a lot of this is driven right now by industry and resources, uh, are able to control many qubit systems. And what this has meant is a lot of the problems that people approach in quantum information, they used to be physics problems, but now they're engineering problems. And there are small systems which are allowing us to do things on quantum computers for the first, for the first time. Um, so we're at the tens of qubits with like 2000 control parameters. Um, molecules have, have or molecular simulations have now been done. They're still not outperforming classical computers, but there's actually a platform on, on which to improve quantum computing at this point. Great. Um, Amy. Yeah, uh, so I think for, in brain-computer interfaces, one of the most interesting things um, is that there's, there's been this very long tension between whether the approaches to the problem should focus on purely engineering questions or purely on kind of basic science questions of trying to understand how the brain um, computes. And so I think one of the most interesting and more uh, recent advances in the field is realizing, increasingly we're realizing that we can't actually fully decouple those two things at all. <laughs> um, and that our devices and our engineered systems actually interact with the brain um, very directly. And that um, there's a, some really nice, exciting recent papers sort of highlighting that ultimately the brain is always going to have to learn <laughs> to some extent um, to our devices and that those may, uh, that learning may actually be really, really beneficial. Um, and so I think the, this opens up all sorts of really interesting questions. Um, and a lot of what my research focuses on is this question of how do we interact with a brain that's fundamentally learning and changing all the time? Um, and that opens up both new hard problems and exciting opportunities um, for approaching the problem in a different way. Great, Amy, thanks. Um, and Bowson, before you go, uh, I'm not seeing any questions. So if you have a question that could be about anything um, for our panelists, uh, please feel free to, to post it. Um, I'm looking at some other questions that could come next, but I'd love to have one in the chat. Uh, Bowson. Uh, right. So uh, this is similar to what the other panel said. So for power and energy, for a long time, the focus was on how do you make a better, say, battery, or how do you make a better solar cell? And those were more material science or physics questions. But nowadays, we're getting to a point where the power electronics and the computing around them is more important than the material science. So instead of the focus being on how to make a one, you know, five, one solar cell 5% more efficient, now the question is really about how do you integrate millions of new devices into a power system that's you know, 50 years old. And that's again creating lots of challenges. We're seeing some of them, but a lot of new opportunities to really bring the computing and the system aspect into our research. Cool. Um, so, uh, let's see, without any questions, I think one question that I have that I think is good from our list here is, you know, the UW is described as being a really interdisciplinary um, university. And 
I think all of you are very interdisciplinary people, but I wonder if you could explain a little bit the extent to which the problems you're working on really do span different disciplines and, and for your particular research area, you know, what are those disciplines, but then also how does ECE like fit in? Like, I mean, I think in some cases it's, it's fairly clear in other cases, maybe it, it isn't. So Kaime, do you want to um, look, uh, address that question? Sure. So, um, so my field has been changing really quickly in the past few years, and it's going more systems based. But right now, I would talk about what I've been doing the past eight years or so and, and how it's been more multidisciplinary. So, um, so one example is that, you know, I, I came here to look at how to store information in single defects in crystals. And the way we interact with that is through photons. But eventually we have to connect the photons to other defects. And for that, we need um, photonic devices with switching at single photon levels. And that's where I work with uh, Arkham Majumdar. We also need to tune, who's also an ECs, but this is more on the photonics device related side. Um, then eventually, so right now we're working from more basic defects to devices. Eventually, when we're connecting more devices, we'll have to move move on to systems levels, but we're not there yet. So this is part of what's been emerging over the past, the past couple of years. Um, additionally, I work, these defects also are great sensors. And so I work with a, bio, a biophysicist on using these to sense tiny magnets that have been functionalized, for example, to, to biological systems and DNA. So that's another example on how someone like me, who's very much um, centered in, in quantum, quantum science and engineering, is working with a biologist. So the, the barriers between departments are very low. Yeah, I think quantum is kind of an amazing thing. It's like a total moonshot. Let's build a quantum computer and let's put, I mean, there's so many things from like half the engineer, most of the engineering departments and many of the science departments are involved ultimately, right? It's, it's a pretty amazing effort. Um, Amy, did you want to tackle that question? Sure. Um, so, like I like I mentioned previously, um, brain computer interfaces is a great example of a um, a problem that really has kind of many different ways to to look at it. Um, and so that was one of the um, exciting things about opportunities to be at UW is that we both have fantastic engineering, but then there's also a fantastic medical school and also a lot of neuroscience work. Um, and so uh, my research. Kind of, I, I try as much as possible to wear two hats kind of at the same time. Um, and we always are thinking about our problems both from basic perspective of uh, what can we learn about the brain and how can learning more information about the brain advance tools, and then also how can we develop new tools that might help us study the brain better. Um, and so uh, I have some exciting collaborations um, with folks in um, the Department of Biostructure um, here at UW who are actually building new sensors for making measurements from the brain. Um, the brain is probably one of the harder systems to try to study um, and has kind of huge measurement problems because it's both very, very big. The human brain has something like 86 uh, billion neurons in it. Um, and it's also very um, delicate and has, uh, is very dynamic. Um, so just trying to make any sort of measurement from that requires a lot of collaboration um, and big teams. Um, but then uh, one of the reasons I like being able to sit uh, in the engineering department um, is having opportunities to collaborate with folks like Sam Burden who bring control theory perspectives and start to, when we start thinking about building devices that interact with the brain, we need to have new computational frameworks for thinking about how that is happening. Um, so those are just two examples of uh, collaborations that I have. Yeah, and I think, you know, in just uh, to restate it, I got a little distracted by the Q&A, but, um, you know, the UW is, is a, you know, in terms of neuroscience and neurotechnology is a real powerhouse. 
and there's there's faculty in many many different departments and really world class research programs going yeah. on. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. All right. So before this seminar today, I was I was in a, a seminar hosted by the Washington Academy of Sciences on decolonization today. And uh, so in that seminar, you know, we have people from talking about batteries to data centers to uh, solar and wind, always a goal of how do we get to you know, carbon neutral, let's say by 2050, and how do we get to 100% renewables you know, by you know, in 30 or 40 years. And if you look at that, one that shows the collaboration we have in here, right? So with you know, Clean Energy Institute, we have folks working all the way from the molecular side to the policy side. And you look at ECE, when you think about it, you want to talk about decarbonization. The grid is in the center of the entire system. Right? One way to decarbonize stuff is to, let's say, move transportation to electric vehicles. And you have to charge them somehow. So you have to collect them to the grid. And within our department, we have people who like Brian Johnson working on electronics. So how do you actually connect you know, an electric vehicle that's consuming power that's around you know, 10 normal households? How do you charge that fast? How do you do that safely? We have people like Daniel Kirshen thinking about how do you structure the market? How do you, you know, actually operate the power system and, and have a market? So that's you know, the role we play in the system. And to answer a question in chat, I think, you know, one question is, where is the US on adaptive power grids and how do it compare to other countries? Uh, there's good news and bad news. Uh, the bad news is, if you look at the really, well, the high voltage level, you look at the high voltage uh, power lines, we are not doing anything. Okay, so. We have not built a new transmission line in the state of Washington that's above 500 kV in the last 20, 30 years and doesn't look like we'll build any. So in that respect, we're you know, behind other countries. You have countries like China building high voltage lines all the time. The good news is that we're probably the world leader on the edge, meaning that we have the you know, best new battery technology, the best solar technology, we have the best power electronics. So the interesting challenge is how do we integrate all these new resources that has a lot of potential to the grid? Um, you know, that's an interesting question about talking about the US position relative to other countries. And that actually has come up in quantum um, cryptography with the um, recent uh, demonstration um, by China of a, of a quantum cryptography system that involves satellites. Um, Kaimei, do you want to talk a little bit about how you know, the US, maybe UW, the US, and, and the world are working on this problem? And at what level is that um, <laughs> sort of competition? How is it going? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that the there is definitely competition right now. And the fact that China is investing so much money in quantum information science and technology has spurred a significant amount of investment in quantum information science and technology from our government. Um, over the past two years, actually, it's just completely ramped up. And that's because uh, what, what China did was something that uh, I think most US scientists knew was possible, but didn't want to invest the engineering resources into doing it. Um, and that is that they did was they were able to securely generate uh, a key or do distributed key distribution um, between between a ground station and a satellite and then later on between a satellite down the two points in two ground stations and this is fundamentally secure by the laws of physics I don't remember what the bit rates were but I think it might be a Hertz something like that <laughs> nothing nothing uh, enormous but they had a signal and you can optimize a signal right yeah. and so that i think that was something that was a game changer was we could imagine getting a signal but it seems so small what to do with it next but actually getting the signal was really important and that's also what ibm did which they said i remember they said we're going to build a five cubit computer and everyone in the field including myself was like well why would you do that I can simulate a five qubit computer, but actually doing that changed changed the mindset 
And it turned out there were things that we didn't think about or study because we didn't have a five qubit computer that we could play with. And pretty soon we'll have one in our basement, right? <laughs> I hope so. Okay. <laughs> Um, you know, a similar kind of question, maybe not about international competition, but Amy, you know, um, like one of the things that people keep seeing in the news is, uh, you know, Elon Musk and Neuralink and, you know, um, interfacing with pig brains and, and all this stuff. Like what's happening? Like I see there's a lot of obvious medical applications, neuroprosthetics and, and injury rehabilitation and, and stuff like that. But are there, is there a market beyond that um, for consumers with brain computer interfaces? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's a very exciting time to be a neural engineer. Um, for sure, the landscape is really changing very quickly with a lot of industry becoming very interested in the things that have been brewing for a while now in the academic spheres. Um, in terms of, you know, if we think broadly and beyond um, academic or sorry, medical applications, brain computer interfaces to me have kind of a huge potential to really change the fundamentals of how humans interact with technology, right? So right now, if you think about how you interact with your computer, we're very limited by physical interactions of so a keyboard, a mouse, a touch screen. And if you're ever frustrated when you're trying to type out a text, right, to a friend with your touch screen interface, um, you can imagine the appeal of being able to just think what you want to type to someone and the message gets sent. Um, so I think that's definitely sort of the in the spaces where you see people, uh, companies investing in this technology, that is the flavor of what they're looking towards. Right now, a lot of the applications are more towards gaming, um, but I think that's the um, a, a very clear potential application for kind of consumers broadly. Mm -hmm. um, I wanna tackle one of these questions that I thought was kind of interesting from um, uh, Miki Tokola. Uh, Hope I'm pronouncing that approximately right. Um, is the priority on helping students be successful in industry or to advance research? Which is kind of an interesting um, question. I think um, we have a, a very big student body and we have undergraduate students, we have master's students, we have graduate students, we have professional master's students. Um, all of those students have different needs and different career goals. And even if you just look at our undergraduate population, some fraction of them will go directly in the industry upon graduating and some other fraction will go apply to grad school and and take on research and and really um, do we have a priority with those uh, I think we try to balance them and not try to prioritize um, either one um, I suppose a, an interesting follow-up question would be how does the research that that you three are doing influence what say is happening in the curriculum so uh so that our undergraduates learning how to build brain computer interfaces quantum computers and and smart grids <laughs> right um is kind of a question and we could we could choose any one of you who wants to answer that if you don't all want to answer that and then also while someone is answering if the other two people could look in the q a and the web chat and see if there's a question you'd like to answer, that would be great, because I'm having a hard time choosing. There's so many. Uh, sure, I'll try to answer uh, how our research is going into the classes. So some of you may have taken the 351 class or the O351 class. And that class, you know, until about 10 years ago was actually a machines class. So the focus of that class is how does a motor work? How does a synchronous generator work? Nowadays, if you go to that class and tell the students, I'm gonna tell you how a synchronous generator work, they all drop the class. Okay, you start with 40 students, after one lecture you have 10. <laughs> Who has to take the class to graduate? So, the, so we have to revamp the class. And the way we read, we, we redid the class as instead of you know, talking to students, this is a generator, this is a transformer, this you know, how, how, how home works. As instead, we're talking about, if, let's say we're building an electric vehicle. 
<laughs> we are building this luxury vehicle and we are to charge it. How do we do that? Then that evolves power electronics, that evolves motors and drives, that evolves how those things come together, which was not present you know, 10 years ago. That leads us to, there's a battery in the vehicle. How does that battery interface with the grid? Then if I'm building a grid where my load is changing from, let's say induction motors to things like electric vehicles, then how will the grid change? So all of these are actually new things we're doing and that is being put into our 351 class, which is actually the first class you take if you do a power system specialization. So there's a lot, quite a bit changing in that class. And so students are you know, very happy about that. We have been keeping you know, 60, 70 students coming out of that class last few years. Um, Basin, another question that someone had for you is curious on your thoughts on the use of AI or machine right. learning applications within power for, or for advanced controls, right. operational optimization, market load right. forecasting. Um, is that something be, being done and, and are we teaching our students that stuff? Right, so yeah, so that is something we're doing. Uh, that is, so, uh, so, AI, you know, you hear a lot about AI. And uh, the thing for implementing something like AI in power system is power system, we're very uh, risk over, like we don't want to take risks in power systems. So if you train an AI algorithm, you say this thing achieves 99% accuracy, you know, computer scientists are pretty happy about it. If you tell a power system engineer, oh, this thing works 99% of the time, they give, you know, it's a heart attack for those power system engineers. So, that's not something they will use. So one important thing we use AI is, you know, how do we make sure the hard constraints uh, in the system being obeyed? And that's some of the research we're doing. And the good example of that is, uh, so if you follow the news in California, you'll see the electric grid is not doing too well in California. And the one thing we need is we need a lot of flexibility in the grid. And one way to use flexibility is to use the buildings as a battery, because you can think of building as this giant load that has a lot of uh, flexibility. So if I turn the AC off, you will not feel it in the next five, 10 minutes. So that gives us some uh, room to play around with it. But the building model is complicated. And if you write it down by hand, uh, some, you know, a hundred order partial differential equation system that nobody ever understands. So the good way is to use AI to learn that, but to learn in a way that respects the uh, limits of the building and the grid. And we're teaching this in class actually. So we have a professional master's class and we teach a class called the data-driven power system or some title like that. It's basically how do we use these new algorithms in AI to do things for power system like forecasting, like building control, like trying to understand the grid, and what is different about the engineering requirements than the conventional AI algorithms? So we taught it once, so it's, I think it's you know, received fairly well. We're planning to teach that again in the future. I wanna take that class. Um, so Kaime or Amy, did you see a question that you wanna to respond to? Um, I, can, I can start, there was a, a great question um, or about uh, potential misuses of um, brain computer interface technology. Um, and I think that uh, this is absolutely a, a concern and something that the field is starting to grapple with and realize the sort of potential ethical issues of the technology. Um, and one of the really fantastic things about UW is that we're actually one of the leaders in neuroethics as well as neural engineering. Um, and that I think is not an accident. Um, and it was in large part came about because of a, the Center for Neurotechnology um, that's founded here at UW that had neuroethics as kind of an integrated piece. Um, so there's actually um, fantastic programs where basically philosophy graduate students are working alongside engineers. Um, and Howard, Howard Chizik, uh, who's faculty in the department uh, recently um, retiring, um, is a great example of someone who's also done work in uh, neurosecurity questions um, that kind of really get at some of these ethical issues. Um, but it's a, it's a very important point. 
Yeah, I actually think that, um, uh, you know, for those of you who maybe haven't been in the department for a while, one of the things that in our department and in engineering broadly, uh, a lot more people, a lot more students are more and more interested in responsible innovation and risk and ethics and equality um, and in, in the technologies that we bring into the world. Um, and we are trying to respond by um, introducing those concepts in more and more of our classes, having speakers who talk about issues like that um, and, uh, and having some seminar series and things like that. So it's a, it's a pretty big deal um, for us going forward. Most of our students who come to us now want to save the world and they want to do it in a responsible, uh, ethical and, and sort of socially conscious way. So it's, it's pretty exciting stuff. And I think that, you know, Amy's research is like at the cutting edge of where questions like that um, really, really, really have to be answered. Kaime, do you have a question you see that, that you like, um, would like to answer? There's, there's one that's a bit dangerous. Um, Good, go for that one. Uh, <laughs> it's from Tom who asks, quantum computing, is the technology on a path to commercial systems devices? And if so, can you speculate when that might be realized? Uh -huh. so, that's the that's the dangerous one. Um, so, so yes, there's the, the, the thing about quantum information science technology is there's a huge spectrum. So already there are companies that are that are building small quantum sensors for specialized um, applications. But the question is probably when is it going to be truly disruptive to our lives? Um, I will speculate that it's probably not going to be in the next five years. So what we're seeing now are systems in computing that will be cloud-based, that will be very expensive. And if you have a very specialized problem, it, it, it may be advantageous to use this resource for a specialized problem. Um, and then additionally, if you really need a secure system, there'll be ways to fundamentally secure, send secure messages, but for most people, they don't require the level of security and the cost in the next five years would be prohibitive except for um, probably uh, defense reasons to want to have that type of security. So um, then I think it will be outward of five years before we see this affecting, affecting our everyday lives. I will say one way that it will affect it, which is less like in our smartphone devices, is in simulating materials. So that's a huge one that again, I think it's still probably five years out, we'll be actually advancing our discovery and materials because we can actually simulate quantum mechanically the materials. Mm -hmm. Ralston, do you see a question that you would like to answer? Uh, sure, yeah, I started a question from Sean. Basically it says, you know, the state of energy storage advanced to the point where power system control through power trans and programming uh, is more important than material science. And uh, why is that? Uh, so if you look at the cost, let's say of a solar cell, if you buy, you know, go out and buy a solar cell, what's the cost of that? So actually half the cost of the material of making the solar cell Half of it is actually the power electronics around it. So in the past you know, decade or so, you've seen the cost going down like this, almost like Moore's law. It gets you know, halved every year. That people, we feel, is probably will stop because the, power, the, sort of the electronics and programming starts to dominate the cost. And uh, we're, so that's the nice thing about EC department, we have people working on electronics from the, uh, microwatt level to the kilowatt level addressing this problem. How do you make the electronics more efficient, more reliable in some of the materials? And also from a grid perspective, is it's more important for the grid to have a resource I can dispatch rather than a resource that's, you know, 2% more efficient. So if you tell a, a person operator that, you know, my battery is 2% more efficient, they'll be like, yeah, sure, you know, it's a better battery. But if you tell them uh, my battery will respond to you immediately, right, you can charge and discharge, and it will lessen, it will, you know, offer you flexibility in the grid. 
that's much more important. So that's why the electronics of control the program is starting to be more important for us. How about you, Amy? Do you see a question that, that you wanna tackle? Uh, sure. Um, so Kay, Kay had a good question about um, brain machine interfaces, whether they can become two-way control. Um, so the machine could control the brain. Um, and uh, the short answer is yes, and that those uh, basically already exist. So we've um, developed brain machine interfaces that both can read out information from the brain so that you can control an external device with your neural activity, but you can also make uh, write in brain machine interfaces that for instance, take, could relay touch information um, so that you, a sensor detects that someone has touched an artificial hand, for instance, and then you stimulate the brain to relay that information. Um, and it right now feels a little bit artificial, but it, um, you can perceive that in some way as, as touch. Um, and so we have kind of these two read out and write in options. Um, there's a lot of interesting technical challenges um, around getting them to work well together <laughs> so that you can have, for instance, a robotic limb that you could control with your neural activity and then also feel uh, when, when someone touches it. Um, the, the way that you stimulate the brain is through mostly electrical activity um, and that uh, generates all sorts of artifacts that then disrupt the right read out. Um, so there's actually some faculty in ECE, uh, Chris Rudell and Vistrash Sathe, who have done some really great work on um, designing nice circuits that are optimized to try to minimize some of those artifacts um, and to try to get all of these pieces that could work together in kind of a final device. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Kaime, there's a question from Christian Schmidt. Do you see that one? Is that... I can, I can take this one. Uh, this is an interesting one. It says, I can see how quantum computing could someday solve computationally hard problems for basic science. But wouldn't we want for everyday computing to be sure that computers remain fully deterministic in nature? You would think that by nature, quantum computing could inject randomness into algorithms, thus making results difficult to comprehend since there is no unique causal pathway. So one, one curious thing about quantum mechanics that that we forget is that it's actually deterministic. The equation of motion for a quantum mechanical particle, Schrodinger's equation, or system, is entirely deterministic. The randomness comes at the very end when you do a measurement, right? Because it's a deterministic equation for probabilities, which is coming out. And so there is nothing random in most computational circuits. And the cleverness comes out at making sure that when you are doing a measurement, that the measurement is what you want to measure. And one way to think about it is actually there's, there's computations going on all, all the time, right? If you take a material, there's all these quantum mechanical interactions occurring, and then perhaps it has some unique property like superconductivity. That superconductivity is always going to be there. It's always going to be an outcome of the ground state of that particular material, and that's completely deterministic, even though all the interactions are, are quantum mechanical in this way. So the main reason why we don't want to use them for a lot of computations is just that you don't need to, right? We Our classical computers can solve a lot of problems very efficiently. It's only for um, some particular problems that it's been proven that quantum mechanics can have an advantage. So that's the, the main reason why not all problems would want to be solved in a quantum computer. What would you say just what are the, the I mean, you mentioned um, simulation of, uh, of materials and, and molecules, right? Um, and, you know, people talk about like prime number factoring or not factoring, but checking for primality. Um, what are the problems where, where we definitely know? Yeah. Right. It is factoring. Yeah. Factoring is the thing? Well, no, no. I was going to say, it's not just checking if something is prime, but it, it's... And, and it is probably Yeah. And are there other ones? Are there, you know, like, actually, I'm kind of confused because I don't understand, like, the, 
like the, some of the MP complete problems, actually you can't solve any faster with a quantum computer than a classical computer. So there's like this very weird set of problems where it's actually advantageous. I don't... Yeah, so I don't think people know. So this is where I would, I would say everyone should come to the Lido lecture because these types of computational complexity problems are what Scott Aronson can really tackle. If you want to know what I do in the laboratory, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at single photons interacting with single defects. I'm storing one qubit of information and I'm watching that qubit decay. And then I'm determining what's causing it to decay and how well I can control this one quantum bit of information. So that's my real expertise. But of course I'm in the field, so, so I, 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 am, I am listening and I'm hearing what people are saying. So I, I would say another class that's very intriguing but hasn't been proven to definitely be more efficient is, is quantum annealing algorithms to find a ground state of optimization problems. So that's one area where uh, definitely people want to be playing with quantum computers and theorists being thinking about it, whether or not they can solve optimization problems more quickly, such as traveling salesman type problems. Cool. Allison, if we haven't made any new um, transmission lines, is there any hope that we're going to get to a, what was that question? That seems like a good question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. Is it, is it a political will? Is it a technological problem? Is it, what is it? Right. So that's a good question. So I think I'm trying to find the question. Yeah, it was. So uh, Ishan asked a Ishan. question of we're not building uh, high voltage transmission lines anymore, which we're not. Do you see a possibility of rise to a decentralized grid? What technology is necessary and so on? So we are seeing a move towards more decentralized grid. One reason is for reliability purposes. So the grid, uh, so the US is made off of three big grids. So we have the Western Interconnect, the Eastern Interconnect, and Texas, which is our own grid. And uh, now we're seeing basically an outage in part of the grid may cause outage somewhere far away. And the one movement is to build these things called the microgrids, which can, let's say, outage happens, but can provide a community with power for the next 12 hours. And uh, you know, we're involving a lot of effort around Peter Sound area. So we have you know, collaboration with Snohomish PUD. We have collaborations with PSE, with South Sea Light trying to demo some of these uh, small microgrid projects. So would this help us move towards uh, decarbonization? One thought is yes, because the grid has always been operated with a notion that reliability is more important than anything. So we should get to 99.999% you know, .99 reliability. That we will not be able to do if we want 100% renewable integration or even 80% renewable integration. So we need to move from, you know, everything is on mode all the time to something like a best effort service. And to do that, being decentralized is actually helpful. Because if one part of the system go out, not the entire system will go out. So a centralized system, you know, is both more efficient but more brittle in some sense. And talking about the policy, so uh, Daniel Christian, the professor in our department, is leading a big effort to create a center that thinks about this kind of questions and also from a policy point of view. Because what we don't want to do is we don't want the, let's say, you know, Amazon or Microsoft or you know, the wealthy neighborhood of Seattle say, okay, I'm gonna build my own grid. I'm gonna make sure I have power 100% of the time. I won't worry about anybody else. That's perhaps not the model one to go. So we need to think about the policy question of how do we equitably uh, allocate these resources and at the same time achieve our goal of decarbonization and a more reliable grid. And uh, we're one leader in this and we're trying to lead sort of the big center effort in this area. Um, let's see, so uh, I think we have time for a few more questions, so maybe one more round. So pick a question and Amy, do you have a, a question that you wanna respond to? There's one about Anupama asked about translational efforts in neural engineering space. 
Yeah, great. Yeah, I can I can take that. Um, so uh, in terms of translation, um, the biggest focus is uh, uh, focus right now is pretty much on medical applications. Um, my work and um, I would say the, the bulk of the field right now um, really focuses on um, treat restoring motor function, for instance, um, to people who are paralyzed due to spinal cord injury um, or a stroke. Um, uh, there's faculty here um, at UW ECE, Chet Moritz, for instance, who's done some really fantastic work, um, translational work, uh, focusing on applying stimulation to different parts of the spinal cord to um, induce plasticity to try to recover function. Um, and so those, I would say that's kind of the, by far the, the biggest piece. Um, that said, they're one of the exciting things about neural interfaces and neural engineering in general is that there are lots of different potential applications. So um, many of you are probably familiar with cochlear implants um, for restoring um, hearing. Um, there's also a lot of work um, on retinal prostheses. Um, and then I think there was another question here about um, sort of work on memory. Um, so there is also quite a bit of interest in um, memory prostheses, for instance, where if you have um, Alzheimer's, that's largely due to sort of um, damage in the um, hippocampus in your brain that stores these memories um, by delivering stimulation that activates neurons in the hippocampus, you can sometimes sort of help auto-complete um, basically for the brain so that the missing pieces of that circuit um, can be replaced through the stimulation so that the memory, the rest of the brain can then kind of fill in um, what was missing. Um, so there's a lot of potential applications there as well. All right, I think we have time for one more question and then I have some, some concluding remarks. So. Uh, maybe um, Kaime or Bowson, if you have one more question you see on there that you'd like to tackle, um, chime in. I think given the number of, of power questions, I think Bowson should take this one that okay. are still, still open. At the right. Okay, there's Kaime. So solve our power problems. <laughs> I might, I might. <laughs> <laughs> But so I'll tackle the two microgrid questions together. And so Krishna and Dale had a microgrid question. So they're actually related. So the first question is, can microgrid help us better weather a sunspot or solar flare storm? The answer is uh, potentially yes. So different components in the power system is vulnerable to different things. So what we worry about in the solar flare is actually, if you think about transformer, a transformer is basically a giant hunk of metal was you know sheets based around it, and when if the solar flare we have an intense solar flare, what happens is you may melt this whole thing, so it's not a transformer anymore, just one big piece of metal. And the power electronics are actually more uh, resilient under that under that scenario because of shielding and just the way the transformer is being the power electronics is being built. So a microgrid is normally not very reliant on giant transformers. A lot of the power conversion is done via uh, power electronics. So that will help us weather something like solar flare. The second question is, are we looking at, do you see microgrid simplify sink and face issues? Is yes, both in terms of the, uh, in a city scale and also inside something like a data center. So I will focus working on data center and data center essentially now undergoes a weird thing as you get AC power, you convert to DC because you have to charge a battery as backup. You convert that to AC again to the server and then the server converts to DC. So there's a lot of double conversion there and it's not very efficient. So we have, you know, Brian, for example, is looking at how do you just do one DC conversion and how do you, you know, think about balancing stability in that regard. So a lot of microgrids tie very much along with the circuits, and uh, we're very strong in both areas. Okay, great. Well, um, so Jesse, this is, is this it? This is, it's already over? 
we have just three more minutes till okay. six thirty. All right. Um, well, so I think um, uh, that's all the time we have then. So I want to thank the panel members um, for for taking the time and answering the questions. Um, I really, we all really appreciate your um, uh, giving your, your perspective on, on what's going on in your fields. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. I apologize if I didn't get to your question or we didn't get to your question. Um, I'll have to say this is our first attempt at doing this and the, the questions were just coming fast and loose and I <laughs> had a hard time understanding where we were going. So um, we're learning and, and we'll be even better next time. Um, one thing that uh, would be great is if you could, um, you know, uh, get back to us about what your experience was with this um, uh, format and if there's anything you'd like to have us um, present uh, at another one in the future, other research areas, or maybe you want to talk about our teaching mission um, and so on, that would be great uh, to let us know. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Manaz and Zoe from our alumni relations team and Jesse um, and Emily from our uh, events and PR team um, for helping us run uh, today's event and, and coming up with this new format for us. Uh, so thank you very much. You should do your, well, I guess I can't, I don't know how you do applause in this format, but it's a thing. Um, and uh, I want to know that, um, uh, you know, I, I know that many of you um, have have served as um, class speakers and volunteers and board members um, and uh, I really want to uh, thank all of you who've done that to for sharing your time and your talent and your financial support and um, those of you who would like to get more involved in our department um, just let us know and, and we can certainly show you the various avenues for how um, how you can get more involved um, so thank you um, even just for attending this because it's really great to, to, to have you all. I wish that we were in the same room together and we could shake your hands and buy you dinner and all that too. So hopefully in the future we'll be able to do that. Um, if you want uh, the best way to, to in the short term for getting involved in what we're doing is to come to our um, LIDL lecture, which is once again on November 19th and we'll be talking about quantum computing um, and that's going to be a really cool uh, lecture and it's online and you can come and you can ask questions um, and we'll send you um, information about that. Uh, we'll have a follow-up like I said about this format here so um, you know please uh, stay tuned and and uh, um, pay, uh, you know respond to that follow-up email if you have uh, the time and you know in any way you can please stay in touch um, and that's it. Once again, thank you everybody for attending. Thank you to our panelists and our organizers. And I wish everybody a happy and safe and healthy um, um, weekend. So take care.